pass through a couple chop out the fire. One of my favorite circuits uh, that has emerged in the last, uh, let's say, decade or so, and uh, to uh, my great surprise and pleasure, has become wi very widely used in many applications. So, first of all, what's uh, what field of what field of applications are we talking about? We're talking about precision measurements. Very often, you need to amplify a, a small weak or weak sensor signals, boost them up. Um, to larger signal, larger levels to use um, before you apply them to an analog to digital converter. Um, uh, typical examples of such signals could be in uh, biopotential bio applications where you have uh, very small signals, millivolts, you want to boost them up. Um, you might also want to uh, read out the voltage across a shunt resistor for battery monitoring or for sensing the current drawn by uh, the motor and for general purpose sensor readout. Now, typically what we do with these weak signals is we don't try and uh, digitize them directly. First of all, we need to amplify them first, and then we can connect them to more or less, uh, let's say, standard ADC. So the amplifier is actually your, uh, is the buffer. The amplifier is the thing that takes the weak signal, conditions it, uh, produces an output amplitude which is large enough for the following A to D converter or whatever to process. So how do we make an instrumentation amplifier? Because that's what we are looking for, an instrumentation amplifier. Here's a very simple uh, instrumentation amplifier. It doesn't get any simpler than that. What makes it uh, good? Well, what makes it good is feedback, right? Um, um, here I'm showing it really simple because actually it would be a fully differential circuit. But for simplicity, I always like to go to keep them a circuit single-ended because it makes it easier to understand. But in reality, this would be, you would have four resistors are, um, situated around a fully differential amplifier. So you could say this is a very crude, uh, very basic instrumentation amplifier. It takes a differential input signal and converts it to an amplified differential output signal, but it has all kinds of drawbacks. Well, one of, the, uh, one of those drawbacks is that the presence of those resistors adds additional noise. Um, the input impedance is restricted to the impedance of, that, of the input resistor R in. And the last uh, but not least uh, drawback is the fact that resistor matching is going to severely limit this, the common mode rejection ratio of this kind of amplifier to typically somewhere between 40 and 60 dB, depending on what kind of matching that you can get. All right, we all know the better alternative. This is the better alternative, the classic three op-amp instrumentation amplifier. And this solves a lot of problems of that basic circuit. It has a very high input impedance, it has good common mode rejection ratio, um, but it also has a few drawbacks. First of all, compared to that very basic circuit, it's much more complex. Um, and because its gain is still defined by resistors, you, you still have that excess noise penalty to pay because the resistors will add noise. And its power consumption is also higher than that simple circuit I showed because now you have two critical operational amplifiers in your front end. So what can we do? Well, you can do something a bit more um, sophisticated you can go to a so-called current feedback instrumentation amplifier where you replace those two op-amps that you had in the previous circuit with two amplifiers, so now they're just simple trans transconductors. And basically, they're still doing the same thing, so you have these two amplifiers which are basically absorbing the common mode of the input signal, and you have an output stage. So. This amplifier, it, it is a bit better in the sense that um, you, instead of having full operational amplifiers, you just have two simpler amplifiers, so its power consumption is medium. Um, because of its topology, and I will not go into the details, it does have a wider common mode range and better common mode rejection ratio than, let's say, the classic topology. But because the gain is in part uh, defined by the matching of, two, of these two transconductors, its gain accuracy is not that great, and uh, the GMs themselves are just like resistors, they also produce noise, and you also have a feedback network, so yeah, it's better, but it's it doesn't take you all the way to where you might like. 
So here comes the innovative step. The innovative step is, why don't you replace uh, resistive feedback with capacitive feedback? Because this would solve all the problems, right? Because capacitors are basically noiseless. So if you use capacitors, uh, then you, are, you solve the excess noise problems. And uh, capacitors, at least in integrated circuits, match better than resistors. So this kind of circuit should have better performance. And there's still now only one critical amplifier, so it can be low power. But there's a little problem here. What do you do with DC? Is DC important? Yeah, of course DC is important. If you're working with sensors, DC is everything. I mean, you want to measure DC signals. If you want to measure biopotential signals, it doesn't get above one kilohertz. So DC is very important. And this guy doesn't do DC very well because, yeah, remember a capacitor is two plates and air in between. So uh, there's no way DC is going to go through. So, but this structure is interesting. So here comes the solution. What we're going to do is we're just going to add choppers everywhere. So we're going to take our input signal, which is DC, and we're going to upmodulate it. We're going to convert it into AC by using a chopper. So what is a chopper, in case you don't know? It's a simply, it's simply a polarity reversing switch, which is driven by, driven by, let's say, some kind of modulation signal. And basically, it will convert your DC into a square wave, an AC signal. And once it is AC, your capacitance act now like impedances, and so they will pass AC signals fine. And at the output, you also introduce some choppers to convert the AC signal back to DC. And last but not least, you need this guy over here to ensure that you still have negative feedback. Uh, it was just on cue. Uh, <laughs> you missed the timing, negative feedback. Uh, <laughs> oh, it seems I get my 30 minutes back. I get a reset. That's good. Uh, I'll take that. Uh, Yeah. This is a reason to have the backup. <laughs> this is where I go for the mechanical alternative. <laughs> uh, the, the, the marker, I can use a marker. Oh, no, probably not a good idea on the screen. Um, but yeah, if you still have that picture in front of you, 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 you see those choppers, and basically the whole idea is I'm going to cur turn my DC input signals into AC signals, and then suddenly my capacitive feedback works because basically I'm using those capacitors as impedances. And if you, if you know something about chopper amplifiers, you may realize that we also get other benefits because when you have a chopper amplifier, it will naturally give you low offset, it will reduce your one, it will mitigate your one of F noise, and it will give you high common mode rejection ratio and high power supply rejection ratio. So actually, just this, just adding these choppers to this capacitive feedback amplifier suddenly turns this from an ordinary idea into actually a sort of superhero of amplifiers. Are we there? We are still yeah. coming. So you now have an amplifier which is basically simple. Uh, it uses capacitive feedback. Um, you have well, uh, good matching, you have low offset, you have low noise, you have uh, good power efficiency, and you have a high common mode rejection ratio. Yeah. So that's the circuit. I wish I could say that this was my invention, but it was invented by Tim Dennison, who presented it for the first time at ISC, I believe, 2007, where I was in the audience, and I went up to him afterwards and said, this is a very interesting circuit. It's also very interesting because um, it's a continuous time circuit. It's not, it's their capacitors and their switches, but it's not a switch cap circuit. Why is this crucial? Because if you have a switch cap circuit, you will have KT over C noise. And KT over C noise would, would mean that you would have to use pretty large capacitances. But it's actually a continuous time uh, circuit. And the easiest way to show that is if there's a little wiggle over here, you'll 
immediately be a little wiggle at output. So that's the way to see it as a continuous time circuit. All right. Uh, well, let's now start talking about uh, some of the issues, because, of course, there's no free lunch. And over the last 10 years or so, we've been working on, uh, let's say, smoothing out the wrinkles associated with this uh, uh, approach. So in the first place, that amplifier is going to have some offset. Uh, that offset, that red uh, uh, circle over there, will get amplified and will appear at the output as ripple. And if you have a high gain amplifier, well, then uh, that ripple is pretty large and it will eat up all your dynamic range. So what can you do? Well, we, you, you can then use some ripple reduction techniques. And one of the uh, uh, techniques that we used was a ripple reduction loop. And basically, this is nothing more than a sort of sensing circuit, an auxiliary circuit that senses the output ripple and drives a, a signal through an integrator back into the main amplifier to cancel its offset. So at steady state, the ripple gets cancelled. Another um, uh, even simpler technique is to use auto-zeroing. And here the idea is that uh, when you close this switch over here, uh, basically any offset that is here gets stored on this input capacitance. If you do that, then uh, as soon as you open the switch, the offset is stored and your ripple is gone. Now, this is uh, very, very simple, but it, obviously it has a limited application because your system needs to have a moment where you can do this. But in many, let's say, biopotential applications, this is no problem. You do your uh, uh, auto zero or CDS um, um, in a small fraction of a second, and then your amplifier will work happily over, let's say, a second or so. So you can be doing it periodically, or if you're doing A to D conversion, you can do it at the start of the conversion, and then uh, you can also cancel your offset this way. What about another challenge, which is input impedance? Because um, I've replaced those resistors of our basic circuit with switched, uh, or let's say modulated capacitors, I shouldn't say switched capacitors, and therefore um, the input uh, source is going to have to, this source over here, or your sensor, is going to have to continuously charge and discharge those capacitors. And that means that this capacitance appears like an impedance, which is proportional to your chopping frequency and the magnitude of this capacitance. Now, you might say, if I look at this equation, I should just make this capacitance very small, and then my impedance will be very high. But yeah, if you make your capacitor very small, this one, the feedback capacitor has to be even smaller, and rapidly you run, you run into matching problems, into feasibility problems, so there are limits. Um, in some applications, just to give you an order of magnitude, this uh, impedance will typically be in the order of a few mega ohms. So in some applications, yeah, this is not a problem, but there are a whole range of applications where we want to have really high impedance. So over the last 10 years, uh, different techniques have been improved to boost the input impedance. And a very simple technique is shown here. And uh, this involves the addition of one extra capacitor and a modulator, a chopper. And basically the idea of this is to feed back some of the output, the output signal and feed back some current back to the input. And basically this positive feedback, if you can arrange that this positive feedback current is equal to uh, the current that goes into um, the feedback network, then if effectively this circuit would have an infinite input impedance. Now, uh, obviously this is not a good idea because at the moment that this happens, you will get instability because actually this is a positive feedback loop. So you typically what, ha what happens is either you back off from the edge um, and therefore you will only boost your input impedance, let's say by a factor of 1000 or so, or in practice you rely on the fact there's always going to be some parasitic capacitance over here. So if you arrange all these ratios to for uh, ideal cancellation, the presence of some parasitic over here will be enough to ensure that your amplifier will not uh, oscillate and your impedance boost will be restricted to about a factor 100 or so, which uh, will take your input impedance from a few mega ohms to a few hundreds of mega ohms, which is good enough for uh, most applications. Yet another technique that can be used is the is a small buffer over here, and this is a little bit more uh, 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 complicated. 
but it works really well. And the idea is that you have a buffer over here. And what it does is that it precharges the capacitor during the intervals between the chopping moments. So you create a little dead time in between your chopper transitions. And in that dead time, you can precharge these capacitors. So what's the benefit of this? The benefit of this is that, first of all, you are completely free from stability issues, so you don't have to worry about that. And this buffer can be very simple because it doesn't have to charge these capacitors precisely. It just has to charge it approximately to the right value because in the end, you are still going to connect the capacitor back to the input signal, right? So um, I, oh, I forgot to say that during the dead time, if you look at the switching, these choppers are fully open. So during the dead time, the signal goes like this. The capacitance is roughly charged. And during the majority of the time, it's connected to the input signal. So any errors caused by the buffers will eventually um, be canceled. So this is a, a really nice circuit because it gives you a, a high impedance over a very wide range of frequencies. In that positive feedback scheme I showed, you're kind of limited by the, the bandwidth of the amplifier itself because at higher frequencies, it cannot feed back the right signal. Um, now, let's uh, talk about the elephant in the room because we haven't, uh, so the observant people might have noticed who is taking care of this voltage? Because this voltage, yeah, you, if you set it and you don't do anything, well, it's just, it just capacitors there. So this voltage will eventually drift somewhere. Your amplifier will stop working. So we have to put some kind of um, biasing circuit. Um, one way to make this biasing circuit is just to use a large resistor over here. Um, well, if you use a large resistor, how large? Well, it turns out that if you, if you want to avoid being impacted by the current noise associated with this resistor, you need mega ohms of input resistance. And mega ohm resistors are typically physically large resistors in the real, uh, at PCB level, but also on a chip. So this is not really uh, uh, desirable. Um, what can you do? You can do a little bit better. You can use these kind of circuits. You can either use a switch capacitor circuit to emulate a large resistor. And again, um, in this case, you can really use a small capacitance and make a, emulate a really large physical resistance. So that works. And recently, because, uh, yeah, the switch capacitor uh, circuits, well, you're, all, you're, you're injecting some spikes into your input load. What people have also looked at is switched resistors or duty cycle resistors which allow you to get an effectively high impedance from a physical resistor. So these are two tricks that have become increasingly popular and you see them uh, being used uh, in many uh, uh, CCIAs. What about the common mode settling? Because no matter how you make this resistor, it's still going to be high impedance. So basically this is a high impedance node. So if you give the circuit a common mode kick, well, then this node will move and eventually, because there's a resistor there, it will slowly return back to its nominal value. In between, of course, at the peak of the peak of, of, the, of the kick, the, the amplifier probably will stop working because it's uh, completely gone out of its common mode range. Um, and uh, the generic problem is at startup, because as soon as you, you, when you turn on the power of your circuit, that's equivalent to a kick, and it takes a long time for your amplifier to... Uh, start working normally. Solution to that is to do some resetting. So what you can do is you can add some uh, additional switches to uh, take care to reset the levels and the inputs and outputs of these capacitances so that um, at power up, you can quickly set up the amplifier and then you can open the switches and then everything will work as normal. Um, and um, I didn't mention it, but that um, auto zeroing technique I showed before also works in the same way because it will also work to reset the common mode level at the input of the amplifier. So those are two kinds of techniques you can use. But still coming back to the common mode because, okay, yeah, I talked about the kicks associated with power on, but what about the kicks, the common mode kicks that could be coming from outside? And typically in a biopotential application, you may have this. So you connect some electrodes to the body but your body is an antenna, it picks up huge amounts of 50 hertz, 
And these 50 hertz signals are much larger than the small biopotential signals you want to measure. And if you look at this network, you can easily imagine that if I have a couple mode signal over here, I will also, because this is just a couple, some kind of fancy divider, I will also have a common mode signal over there. And this common mode signal can overpower your amplifier because if it exceeds the common mode uh, 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 range of the amplifier, the amplifier will also stop working. What can we do about this? Well, now we're getting really fancy. Uh, this was published in 2017. You can have a common mode detecting amplifier which injects a signal over here to cancel the combo mode. Now, okay, it's a little bit fancy, but it really works. And in applications like biopotential sensing where you need this, this is a very uh, uh, nice uh, solution because once again, this amplifier doesn't have to be great. It's just being used to relax the requirements, the core mode requirements on the main amplifier. <laughs> Now, um, in these biopotential applications, another thing problem that you have is something called, known as electrode offset. So here's a, an application, here's some skin, very appropriate after listening to our keynote talk. Uh, you have some electrode that's connected to the skin, but because of the electrochemistry associated between the metal, the sweat on the skin, and, uh, and uh, 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 the nature, basically the nature of skin, there will be a small battery and this will give rise to an offset in the order of 50 millivolts or so. And this could be um, a differential offset. So it's, if it was a common mode offset, it's not a problem. But if it's a differential offset because the electrodes are located at different parts of the skin, obviously, if you want to measure something, well, then uh, this will get amplified and it can easily overpower and saturate your amplifier because this offset is larger than the biopotentials you want to measure. So one trick that has become very popular is to add what is known as a DC servo loop. So what the DC servo loop does is it's just simply an integrator that senses the presence of any DC signal at the output of the amplifier and drives another branch over here to cancel this uh, uh, DC signal. Basically, it means that from here to there, this amplifier acts like a high-pass filter, and being a high-pass filter, it will reject any DC present at the input. The nice thing about this is that the high-pass corner can be defined very well, because it's all related to capacitive ratios, and this amplifier, because it's in the feedback path, all it has to do is be slow. Now, doing, making things slow is not too much of a problem. You just grab them by the neck and uh, sub, uh, reduce the, the, the bias current, and then everything can be slow. So this has also become very popular uh, uh, a way of uh, rejecting uh, electrode offset. Last but not least, we can take advantage of the fact that we don't have resistors over here anymore. We have capacitors. Capacitors reject DC voltages. So that means that we can make a circuit in which um, the DC common mode signal present at the input of the amplifier is much uh, larger than um, uh, the supply rails of the amplifier itself. This is a very interesting feature because it means that I can supply the main amplifier from 1.8 volts, but I can apply signals to the input which go basically up to the breakdown voltage of the, of the capacitor, which in, even in a normal CMOS process can be tens of volts because the capacitor is just two plates. So basically I can hook this up, this circuit over here, to uh, a shunt resistor at the output of the battery. Or I can hook it up to a shunt resistor uh, riding on 230 volts with this kind of circuit. So in principle, I can do this. In practice, there's one little problem who drives this chopper? Because this chopper is also seeing that large common mode voltage. So we have to figure out a way to drive this circuit. Well, we have, and um, that's the last thing I want to show over here. Uh, basically, the trick is to um, use um, a level shifter. And this level shifter can also be capacitive, so you can use a 
can make a catastrophe couple of that shifter. And basically what this does is that it takes the logic signals that you would normally use to drive these switches and adds them to the input signal. So basically your uh, control signals ride up and down with the input signal and are able to continuously drive this input chop. So to summarize my uh, what I've been talking about, I, I think I've shown you that capacitively coupled chopper instrumentation amplifiers, known as CCIAs to their friends, uh, have come a really long way in the last 10 years. Compared to the traditional instrumentation amplifiers, they can simultaneously offer a, lot, a number of benefits. Low offset, low noise, high common mode rejection ratio, and low power. So basically, they offer you everything that you might like to have in an instrumentation amplifier. They do have some drawbacks, but over the, over the last decade or so, techniques have been developed to boost their input impedance, which would, was, is one of their drawbacks, ensure that they can be biased in an area-efficient and fast-settling way. Um, techniques have been developed to improve their robustness to common mode uh, uh, events. And lastly, uh, techniques have been uh, uh, developed to allow them to be used in so-called beyond-the-rails applications. So, uh, despite uh, 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 their attention was not undivided, but uh, <laughs> um, I would like to thank you for listening. And I'm open for questions.